This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Seth Mariscal, Guatemala City, Guatemala. www.angelbw.com on the 19th of October, 2006. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 115 Luigi Vampa's Bill of Fare. We awake from every sleep except the one dreaded by danglers. He awoke. To a parisian accustomed to silken curtains, walls hung with velvet drapery, and the soft perfume of burning wood, the white smoke of which diffuses itself in graceful curves around the room. The appearance of the whitewashed cell, which greeted his eyes on awakening, seemed like the continuation of some disagreeable dream. But in such a situation, a single moment suffices to change the strongest doubt into certainty. Yes, yes, he murmured, I am in the hands of the brigands of whom Albert de Morcerf spoke. His first idea was to breathe, that he might know whether he was wounded. He borrowed this from Don Quixote, the only book he had ever read, but which he still slightly remembered. No, he cried, they have not wounded, but perhaps they have robbed me, and he thrust his hands into his pockets. They were untouched. The hundred louis that he had reserved for his journey from Rome to Venice were in his trouser pocket, and in that of his great coat he found the little note case containing his letter of credit for five million and fifty thousand francs singular bandits he exclaimed they have left me my purse and my pocketbook as i was saying last night they intended me to be ransomed hello here's my watch let me see what time it is dangler's watch one of brigut's repeaters which he had carefully wound up on the previous night struck half past five Without this, Danglars would have been quite ignorant of the time, for daylight did not reach his cell. Should he demand an explanation from the bandits, or should he wait patiently for them to propose it? The last alternative seemed the most prudent, so he waited until twelve o'clock. During all this time, a sentinel, who had been relieved at eight o'clock, had been watching his door. Danglars suddenly felt a strong inclination to see the person who kept watch over him. He had noticed that a few rays, not of daylight but from a lamp, penetrated through the ill-joined planks of the door. He approached, just as a brigand was refreshing himself with a mouthful of brandy, which, owing to the leathern bottle containing it, sent forth an odor which was extremely unpleasant to Danglars. Fah! he exclaimed retreating to the farthest corner of his cell. At twelve, this man was replaced by another functionary, and Danglars, wishing to catch sight of his new guardian, approached the door again. He was athletic, gigantic bandit, with large eyes, thick lips, and a flat nose. His red hair fell in disheveled masses like snakes around his shoulders. Ah, ah, cried Danglars. This fellow is more like an ogre than anything else. However, I am rather too old and tough to be very good eating. We see that Danglars was collected enough to jest. At the same time, as though to disprove the ogreish propensities, the man took some black bread, cheese, and onions from his wallet, which he began to devour voraciously. May I be hanged, said Dangler, glancing at the bandit's dinner through the crevices of the door. May I be hanged if I can understand how people can eat such filth and he withdrew to seat himself upon his goatskin, which reminded him of the smell of brandy. But the mysteries of nature are incomprehensible, and there are certain invitations contained in even the coarsest food, which appeal very irresistibly to a fasting stomach. Danglars felt his own not to be very well supplied just then, and gradually the man appeared less ugly, the bread less black, and the cheese more fresh, while those dreadful vulgar onions recalled to his mind certain sauces and side dishes which his cook prepared in a very superior manner when he said, Bonjour, Denisot, let me have a little 
Fricas today. He got up and knocked on the door. The bandit raised his head. Danglars knew that he was hurt, so he redoubled his blows. Que cosa? asked the bandit. Come, come, said Danglars, tapping his fingers against the door. I think it is quite time to think of giving me something to eat. But whether he did not understand him, or whether he had received no orders respecting the nourishment of Danglars, the giant, without answering, went on with his dinner. Dangler's feelings were hurt, and not wishing to put himself under obligation to the brute, the banker threw himself down again on his goatskin and did not breathe another word. Four hours passed by, and the giant was replaced by another bandit. Dangler's, who really began to experience sundry gnawings at the stomach, arose softly, again applied his eye to the crack of the door, and recognized the intelligent countenance of his guide. It was, indeed, Peppino, who was preparing to mount guard as comfortably as possible by seating himself opposite to the door and placing between his legs an earthen pan containing chickpeas stewed with bacon. Near the pan, he also placed a pretty little basket of villetri grapes and a flask of orvieto. Peppino was obviously an epicure. Danglars watched these preparations and his mouth watered. Come, he said to himself. Let me try if he will be more tractable than the other. And he gently tapped at the door. On y va, coming, exclaimed Peppino, who, from frequenting the house of Signor Pastrini, understood French perfectly in all its idioms. Danglars immediately recognized him as the man who had called out in such a furious manner, Put in your head! But this was not the time for recriminations. So he assumed his most agreeable manner, and said with a gracious smile, Excuse me, sir, but are they not going to give me any dinner? Does your excellency happen to be hungry? Happen to be hungry? Huh, that's pretty good when I haven't eaten in twenty-four hours, muttered Danglars. Then he added aloud, Yes, sir, I am hungry, very hungry. What would your excellency like? and Peppino placed his pen on the ground so that the steam rose directly under the nostrils of Danglars. Give your orders. Have you kitchens here? Kitchens? Of course, complete ones. And cooks? Excellent. Well, a foul fish game, it signifies little, so that I eat. As your excellency pleases, you mentioned a fowl, I think. Yes, a fowl. Peppino turned around, shouted, a fowl for his excellency. His voice yet echoed in the archway when a handsome, graceful, and half-naked young man appeared, bearing a fowl in a silver dish on his head without the assistance of his hands. I could almost believe myself at the Café de Paris, murmured Danglars. Here, your excellency, said Peppino, taking the fowl from the young bandit and placing it on the worm-eaten table, which, with the stool and the goatskin bed, formed the entire furniture of the cell. Danglars asked for a knife and fork. Here, your excellency, said Peppino, offering him a little blunt knife and a boxwood fork. Danglars took the knife in one hand and the fork in the other, and was about to cut up the fowl. Pardon me, excellency, said Peppino, placing his hand on the banker's shoulder. People pay here before they eat. They might not be satisfied, and... Ah, ah, thought Danglars. This is not so much like Paris, except that I shall probably be skinned. Never mind, I'll fix that all right. I've always heard how cheap poultry is in Italy. I should think a fowl is worth twelve so in Rome. There, he said, throwing a louis down. Peppino picked up the louis, and Danglars again prepared to carve into the fowl. Stay a moment, your excellency, said Peppino, rising. You still owe me something. I said they would skin me, thought Danglars, but resolving to resist the extortion, he said, Come, how much do I owe you for this fowl? Your Excellency has given me a louis on account. A louis on account for fowl? Certainly. And Your Excellency now owes me 4,999 louis. Danglars opened his enormous eyes on hearing this gigantic joke. Come, come, this is very droll, very amusing, I allow. But as I am very hungry, pray allow me to eat. Stay, here is another louis for you. 
Then that will make only 4,998 louis more, said Pepino, with the same indifference. I shall get them all in time. Oh, as for that, said Danglers, angry at this prolongation of the jest, as for that, you won't get them at all. Go to the devil. You do not know with whom you have to deal. Peppino made a sign, and the youth hastily removed the fowl. Danglers threw himself upon his goatskin, and Peppino, reclosing the door, again began eating his peas and bacon. Though Danglers could not see Peppino, the noise of his teeth allowed no doubt as to his occupation. He was certainly eating, and noisily too, like an ill-bred man. Brute, said Danglers. Peppino pretended not to hear him, and without even turning his head, continued to eat slowly. Dangler's stomach felt so empty that it seemed as if it would be impossible ever to fill it again. Still, he had patience for another half hour, which appeared to him like a century. He again arose and went to the door. Come, sir, do not keep me starving here any longer, but tell me what they want. Nay, your excellency, it is you who should tell us what you want. Give us your orders and we will execute them. Then open the door directly. Pepino obeyed. Now look here, I want something to eat. To eat, do you hear? Are you hungry? Come, you understand me. What would your excellency like to eat? A piece of dry bread since the fowls are beyond all price in this accursed place. Bread? Very well. Hello there. Some bread, he called. The youth brought a small loaf. How much? asked Danglers. Four thousand nine hundred and ninety-eight louis, said Pepino. You have paid two louis in advance. What? One hundred thousand francs for a loaf? One hundred thousand francs, repeated Pepino. But you only asked for a hundred thousand francs for a fowl. We have a fixed price for all our provisions. It signifies nothing whether you eat much or little, whether you have ten dishes or one. It is always the same price. What? Still keeping up this silly jest, my dear fellow, it is perfectly ridiculous. Stupid! You had better tell me at once that you intend starving me to death. Oh dear, no, your excellency, unless you intend to commit suicide. Pay and eat. And what am I supposed to pay with, brute? asked Danglers, enraged. Do you suppose I carry a hundred thousand francs in my pocket? Your Excellency has five million fifty thousand francs in your pocket. That will be fifty fowls at a hundred thousand francs apiece, and half a fowl for the fifty thousand. Danglers shuddered. The bandage fell from his eyes, and he understood the joke, which he did not think quite so stupid as he had done just before. Come, he said, if I pay you the hundred thousand francs, will you be satisfied and allow me to eat at my ease? Certainly, said Pepino. But how can I pay them? Oh, nothing's easier. You have an account open with Messieurs Thompson and French via the Bianchi, Rome. Give me a draft for four thousand nine hundred and ninety-eight louis on these gentlemen, and our banker shall take it. Danglers sought it as well to comply with the good grace, so he took the pen, ink, and paper Peppino offered him, wrote the draft, and signed it. Here, he said, here is a draft at sight, and here is your fowl. Danglers sighed while he carved the fowl. It appeared very thin for the price it had cost. As for Peppino, he examined the paper attentively, put it into his pocket, and continued eating his peas.